So this sutta is called old age, yeah? <laughs> there's like one thing after the other, there is violence and then there's old age, there's all these kind of very happy topics that we deal with on the Buddhist path. This is why people think that Buddhists are so down, yeah? Why we are so kind of negative because of all of these uh, things that we contemplate. But of course, the reality is that uh, the, the upside of this is all the positive sides of the path. Uh, so uh, sometimes we, we need to be careful to um, deal with these things in the right way. And as we deal with them in the right way, then they uh, become actually very inspiring. So let's have a look at this sutta. This is also from the uh, Atakavaga of the Sutta Nipata. Uh, this the fourth chapter of the Sutta Nipata, uh, uh, sutta number six, uh, old age. Short, alas, is this life. Uh, you die before a hundred years. Even if you live a little longer, you still die of old age. People grieve over belongings, yet there is no such thing as a permanent possession. Separation is a fact of life. When you see this, you wouldn't stay living at home. Whatever a person thinks of as belonging to them, that too is given up when they die. Knowing this, an astute follower of mine would not be interested in ownership. Just as upon waking up, a person does not see what they encountered in a dream, so too you do not see your loved ones when they are dead and gone. You used to see and hear those people, call them by their name, Yet the name is all that is left to tell of a person when they are gone. Those who are greedy for belongings don't give up sorrow, lamentation and stinginess. That is why the sages, the seers of safety, left possessions behind and wandered. For a mendicant who lives withdrawn, sitting in secluded places, they say it's fitting to not show themselves in the house. The sage is independent everywhere. They don't have likes and dislikes. Lamentation and stinginess slips off them like water from a leaf. Like droplets slip from lotus leaf, like water from a lotus flower. The sage does not cling to that which is seen, heard or thought. For the one who is cleansed does not conceive in terms of things seen, heard, or thought. They do not wish to be purified by another. They are acting neither for passion nor for dispassion. So that is the verse on old age. And it is a nice little poem, as many of these poems are. And I would say very interesting in many ways. And so let's have a, a look at this in a little bit more detail. I'm going to go through each of these verses and just discuss them very briefly. I don't know if we have to go into great detail because some of these things will, I think, be meaningful as it is. But uh, I think it's always nice to have a little bit of more clarity about these things. Yeah? So this, this starts off with a very kind of typical a spiritual idea that life is short, you die before a hundred years, and even if you die a little bit longer, actually, it doesn't make that much difference. You still die anyway of old age eventually. And um, I think, you know, sometimes these very simple truths, uh, the truths that life is short and all of these things, uh, even they are really worthy of a little bit of extra thought, a little bit of extra consideration, because actually they are quite deep in many ways. Yeah? We tend to go through our life as, we, as if we're going to be alive for a long time. Yeah, most of us, we think we're going to be alive tomorrow. But are we going to be alive tomorrow? Are we going to be alive next week, the month after that? It is all so uncertain. Yeah? Life always has this great amount of certainty to it. And the more you understand that certainty, you start to realize the only time to live well is now. Now is the only time you have. Everything else is just so uncertain. 
So it brings the path back to the present moment. It brings the past to the present, to right now. Now is the time to be kind. Now is the time to speak well. Yeah, I'm doing all of this talking. I better talk well because this is my only opportunity. Maybe I won't be here tomorrow. Maybe today is the last time I see you. What if today is the last time I see you? What then? Do I want to leave you in a bad way, having an argument with you, talking to you in a bad way? Or do I want to leave you in a good way, having said something nice, having said something positive, having maybe said something wise even as part of the suttas? How do I want to leave you? I know what I want. I don't want to die having just argued with someone. If I'm going to die, I want to die with a heart which is free, which is relieved of all the burdens of having done bad things, because bad things are burdens of the heart. This is why we have regrets in life. A regret is really a burden of the mind, a burden of the heart. And as long as you do bad things, guaranteed that you will have regrets. So the very simple thought of life is short. You never know when you're going to die. It could be tomorrow. It could be now. Yeah, you could die in the next moment. It's just impossible to know. And the more clarity you have about that, the more you realize now is the time to live well. Simple ideas with powerful consequences if you use them in the right way. Then the Buddha says, people grieve over belongings. Yet there is no such thing as a permanent possession. Separation is a fact of life. When you see this, you wouldn't stay living at home. If you fully understand the impermanence of all the things in your life, all the things that you think are yours, your house, your car, your belongings, everything that you have, the things that you take to be most dear, I don't know, if you lost everything you owned, what is it that you would grieve the most over? What is it that you would not want to lose? That is the thing you are most attached to, yeah? So if you fully understand the impermanence of this, what happens? Well, what happens is you become a monk, you become a nun. That's what it says here. You wouldn't stay living at home, yeah? You would become an ascetic if you really understood this and the reason is because you understand that holding on to all of these possessions is impossible anyway you have them for a while then they are gone they are never really yours in the first place if they really were yours you could hold on to them but you can't all of these things are like borrowed goods one of the famous similes in the suttas is the simile of the borrowed goods yeah Everything in your life is borrowed. It is borrowed from nature. At the end of your life, you have to give it all back again. Yeah, can you remember that? Can you relate to your possessions as borrowed goods? If you can, your attachment is vastly decreased because you know you have it for a while. If something is borrowed, what is your attitude towards it's a different kind of attitude yeah it's not an attitude of control it's not an attitude that i'm going to have this forever it's an attitude of okay i'm going to look after it a little bit i'm not going to care too much because tomorrow i have to give it back again so this is the idea of thinking of everything in your life as a borrowed good something that you have to give back and then of course your idea about what matters in the world starts to change yeah because nothing is permanent, no possessions can really last. Well, what is the one possession that really can last? What is the thing that you really own? And of course, the Buddha says the one thing that we do own, we are the owners of our kamma. And our kamma, what is that? Well, our kamma is just the effect that our actions have on our minds, yeah? If you live well, if you live with good speech and kind actions, you start to feel brighter and more wholesome inside that is your real possession that is what it means by kamma vipaka the building up of good qualities based on doing the good things in the world that is your real possession because that is your real possession that is where you should invest that is what matters so it's kind of awesome yeah how the buddha sees this if you really see this fully there are no permanent possessions 
And this, of course, includes also people in our life. They also are not permanent. The more you see that, the more powerful, the more attractive becomes the spiritual path, because that is where you build up those other qualities that actually are far more permanent that you can take with you into the future life, maybe for many, many lives into the future. In the end, even your kamma is not your possession. In the end, that too will fade away, but it's much, much, much more permanent than all the other things that we can have in this world. Separation is a fact of life. When you see this, you would never want to live in a home. Isn't that kind of amazing? It shows you how shallow our insight often is. We haven't really penetrated what is going on. If we had really penetrated it, we would have already left the household life. Whatever a person thinks of as belonging to them, that too is given up when they die. Knowing this, an astute follower of mine would not be interested in ownership. What's the point of owning stuff when, you, when it is not really yours in the first place? You know that it isn't yours, so there's no point in owning these things. If you own them, if you grasp them, all that happens is that you're asking for trouble in the future. Because in the future, when you have to give it up because you die, you're going to suffer because you are already attached to these things. So ownership is bad. If you think you own those things that cannot be owned, all you're doing is asking for suffering here. Just as upon waking up, a person does not see what they encountered in a dream, so too you do not see your loved ones when they are dead and gone. This is the idea of a dream again. This idea of a dream is something that you see in the suttas in a few places. Yeah? And all your loved ones, all the people that are close to you, one day they will be like a dream. They are no longer there. It will be as if one day you wake up. Now this is the reality. What happened to all the people that I was close to? They're all gone. They're not there anymore. I may never see them again. Was it all just a dream? Was it real? All of those relationships that I had, all the people, all the ownership of the world? Or was it just a dream all along? And of course, the point is that it is real in one sense. It is real in the sense that something happened. But it is not real in the sense that it is something that uh, it is fleeting. It has no inherent essence to it. It is just always moving, always changing. And when there is a world where everything is always moving and changing, and then we try to grasp onto that world, it's like we are grasping a dream. Does it make sense to grasp a dream? You wake up in the morning, the dream is gone. There's no point in grasping that dream. It is not real. In the same way, so many of the things that we experience in this world are not really real in the way we think they are real. They are fleeting moments, fleeting relationships, fleeting things that we have for a short time until nature comes and claims it back again. This is the reality of things. This is what I was saying at the beginning of the retreat, is trying to understand our attachments in this light. Yeah? When you understand your attachments in this light, uh, you can see that, uh, well, what about the attachments you had before, like 20, 30, 40 years ago? What about the attachments that you had in past lives? Uh, and you realize those attachments are irrelevant. Yeah, They don't matter anymore. They are gone once and for all. Uh, and they are, you know, you wonder were they really real? In the same way, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, in your next life, the attachments that you have now, today, are going to seem irrelevant. They're going to seem as if they weren't really real. So how are you relating to the attachments that you have right now? Are you relating them to them as if they are like a temporary thing, a bit like a dream you have at night, and then it is all gone? Or are you relating to them as if they are more solid, as they are more real, as if they are something you can rely on, as if they are a refuge in your life, 
They can never be a refuge because they are far too temporary and far too uncertain. You used to see and hear those folk, call them by the name, yet the name is all that is left to tell of a person when they are gone. Yeah, people pass away, don't attach too much. It's very difficult not to attach at all if you live an ordinary lay life and you have a family member, there's always gonna be some degree of attachment, but remember not to overdo it. Because if you overdo it, you're going to suffer a lot when it eventually it comes to an end. Yeah, it's more, is it better to be independent? It is better to be a master of your own destiny than actually be dependent on other people for your happiness. This is what this is saying. Those who are greedy for belongings don't give up sorrow, lamentation, and stinginess. That's why the sages, the seers of safety, left possessions behind and wandered. If you are greedy for belongings, then uh, you have sorrow and lamentation for a large number of reasons. You have sorrow and lamentation because you have to hold on to it, you have to guard it, uh, and because it is impermanent, because you know that ultimately you cannot hold on to it. Uh, one day it will be gone. Uh, so all the greed in the world is like a narrow thing. It's a small thing that only leads to pains and problems. And the other problem with greed is that it leaves, when you are greedy, it means that you are afraid of the rest of the world. Because the greed means that you are afraid that other people will take what is yours. Yeah? You are afraid of losing things. That's what greed means. And it means again that you are living in this small universe, this me against the world. That's what greed does. It kind of builds a wall around you. That's what greed, greed does and says, this is my world and you stay away. And the world becomes a fearful place. The world becomes a place that is out to get you, that is out to take advantage of you. This is what greed does. But if instead of being greedy, you are generous, yeah, then there is no fear anymore of losing your possessions. And when there is no fear, you become more embracing. It is no longer you against the world, but it is you are part of the world. You are embracing everything around you. And if someone steals from you, you shrug your shoulders and say, actually, it is not my problem. It is their problem. They are the fools because they stole. They will have to bear the consequences. I knew already that my possessions were impermanent. So for me, it is no issue. Expect the unexpected. Expect there to be burglars and things to sometimes steal from you. Those who are greedy for belongings, not only do they sorrow and lament, but they are stingy. Yeah, because this is what it means to be greedy. It means you are holding it for yourself. You're holding back. You're not sharing with the world. But stinginess, again, is a very painful state to be in. It is much better to be in a state where you are sharing with everyone, when your heart kind of opens up to the whole world and you just want to give with others and share with others. That you know that when you have that kind of feeling, you know it is a spiritual quality, a very powerful spiritual quality. Generosity is a beautiful quality. Stinginess is a sad, small, contained quality of you against the world rather than being open to the world around you. When you understand these kind of things, yeah, then you are happy to leave all the possessions behind. And this is what the sages, the seers of real safety, yeah, the yoga, yoga kema is the safety here. If you want real safety, well, actually give it all up and practice something else instead. When you really understand how these possessions are problematic, very powerful verses here uh, and very meaningful. Uh. For a mendicant who lives withdrawn, sitting in a secluded places, uh, they say it's fitting to not show themselves in a house. Uh, yeah, you're no longer interested in houses. Uh, you're no longer attached to those things. Uh, you don't go to hang out there. You just want to be in a secluded place. Uh, you don't want to be with families. You don't want to be 
busy with all kinds of things. You withdraw from all of that, sitting in a secluded place, withdrawn from the world. The sage is independent everywhere. They don't have likes and dislikes. Lamentation and stinginess slips off them like water from a leaf. Yeah, you are independent everywhere, wherever you go, because you don't have desires in the world. The world doesn't have any pull on you. The world cannot pull you or manipulate you in any way anymore. Your happiness comes completely from inside. The world can do whatever it wants and it doesn't affect you. That's why the sage is independent. Yeah, it's a beautiful state when no one in the world can manipulate you. When no one has the ability to draw you in one way or the other because the strength comes from within. You have no likes or dislikes. This refers to the five sense world. Yeah, you have no likes and dislikes in that world. You are equanimous, you are even minded, flowing through the world like a sage. The beautiful sages of the ancient literature. Yeah, you become one of those. No lamentation, no stinginess. You are freely giving, open hearted, open handed, because that is the nature of being a sage. Always giving. It's one of those things that I always like to point out to people is that if you are ever going to make a decision, if you're ever going to have to decide whether someone is a Arya, a noble person or not, whether someone is practicing really well. How do you make those decisions? And one of the ways of seeing that is to see how giving someone is. Yeah, if someone is really giving, if someone is incredibly generous, the more generous they are, the more likely they are to be a Arya, a noble person. You cannot make any absolute judgment. Sometimes you find incredibly generous people who are not Aryas, but that is one of the qualities. If someone is stingy, guaranteed they're not an Arya. So look for the generosity, yeah? Look for the monastics or the lay people who are truly have the spirit of giving, giving to the world without, without holding back at all. That is one of the signs of noble ones. It specifically says in the suttas, it is one of the qualities of the noble people that they are always generous. Without that generosity, it is in fact impossible to become a noble person. Like a droplet slips from a lotus leaf, like water from a lotus flower, the sage doesn't cling to that which is seen, heard, or thought. For the one who is cleansed does not conceive in terms of things seen, heard, or thought. They do not wish to be purified by another. They're acting neither for passion nor for dispassion. So the sage does not cling to that which is seen, heard or thought. Yeah? There's nothing in the world that the sage clings to. There's nothing to hold on to the entire world because holding on always means that there is attachment. And when there is attachment, there is suffering. So no holding on to anything not just possessions, but also not to views. Don't hold on to views. You don't hold on to even your inner life, your inner five khandas, everything just flows. Now we're getting to the very deep dhammas at this particular point. You do not conceive in terms of things seen, heard or thought. This is where it gets very profound again, because conceiving really means misunderstanding. It means thinking in the wrong way about the world. And when you conceive in terms of things seen, heard, or thought, what it actually means, it means that you have craving about these things. It means that you identify with these things. This is what I am. And you think of these things as yours. This is what is mine. Yeah. And you have views about them. And this is the idea of conceiving. It is a proliferation, a misunderstanding about the reality of the world. So now it gets incredibly profound. They do not wish to be purified by another because these are the noble ones. They understand what the Dhamma is. They understand who the Buddha is. They don't look for purification outside of Buddhism because they know that the Buddhist practice is true. 
they know that there is no other practice that is superior or has any deeper insight into the nature of reality. So you don't look elsewhere for teachings. This is another way that you can know whether someone is a noble one. Yeah? Where do they find their inspiration? Uh, is the word of the Buddha, is that what they really are inspired by? Or are they inspired by other things? Uh, because the Buddha is the one who had the insight into non-self, uh, who understand, understood the idea of not conceiving in all these things. Uh, and because of this, you're acting neither for passion nor for dispassion. Uh, the idea here is that if you are acting for passion, it is like you are building up possessions in the world. You're building up the sense of self. This is who I am. This is passion. Yeah? It's the idea of craving, the idea of uh, having a sense of identity. Yeah? But also, you're not acting for dispassion, because if you are an arahant, if you have reached the end of the path, uh, you don't have to practice anymore. Yeah? The person who acts for dispassion are the people who are practicing the path. We're trying to give up the passions. But once you're an arahant, you can relax. Yeah? No more work to be done, no more passion to be carried out, no more dispassion to be reached. Finally, you can breathe, you can be at ease, you can relax. You have become an arahant. That is the idea of arahantship all the way at the end of the path done what should be done, there's no further rebirth in this world, and you can finally breathe a sigh of relief.